Okay. Let's see. Hey, everybody. See Paul here. Hey, Chris, Kieran, Magenta. Hey, Devin. Uh, lots of fun. People, Thomas, nice to see you. Sam, thanks for joining again. Sam, thank you for the notes for DeFi session yesterday. Again, it's awesome. Hey, Bea. Uh, Lori, lots of awesome people. Cool. Thank you for joining. We're really happy uh, to be continuing on the build journey here in search of a mythical DAP user today with Zach Herring, who I uh, got to know very well through Consensus. Um, he was a big part of our early journeys in hackathons and trying to find the best way to take people who are well-intentioned and were excited about the space from zero to one uh, with great ideas to start. They built some of the best prompts that we've seen in Gitcoin Hackathon history that led to projects like Idle Finance and others who kind of use those as the, the jumping off points for, for their, their thought process. And um, since then, Zach's been a major kind of supporter and friend of ours, and, and we really appreciate him being here to talk about the mythical DAP user and what we can do to go from zero to one. Um, before that, check out the chat for, uh, I think Sachin will probably put a link in there, but a link to Expo Week sign up. Uh, we're right around the corner from Expo Week, Zach. There's probably 20 to 25 projects represented in the audience today. And we want as many of you to sign up for Expo Week as are interested. Uh, so check that out in the chat. And and yeah, Zach, we're, we're kind of turning that corner from, um, you know, prototypes to MVPs to to the search for some of these early users, and and you're you're coming just in time for that type of conversation. It's almost like it was planned. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, thanks so much for the uh, introduction, Vivek. Uh, super thrilled to be here, everybody. Um, big fan of Kernel. Uh, I, you know, I think we've, I, this, if this is the second one we've, I've spoken at both, which is really, really cool. Um, and so, yeah, like always, oh, I think one of the, several of the, of the teams that I've helped out with, um, previous or sorry, several of the programs I've helped out with previously have had kernel alums. They've all been amazing people, really interesting projects. So a really high bar has been set on kernel. And so I'm thrilled kind of to, to be able to can, kind of continue uh, walking alongside kernel as, as it uh, continues that journey is honestly a pretty premium fellowship in the space. So thrilled to be here. Um, my talk in search of the mythical DAP user, Sachin was actually telling me that he had shared out some of the uh, growth hacking playbooks that we had built whenever we were over at Relays and Consensus and kind of helping teams start thinking about customer acquisition. Um, I had mentioned that like, oh, cool. Well, like I've actually been giving a talk that's sort of an outgrowth of that playbook plus a couple of other things that um, I've been helping some other teams with as well as like work that I had done in the Web2 space. And, and so this is kind of where this, this talk has sort of grown out of. In search of the mythical DAP user, it's an extremely zero to one approach to finding strangers and converting them to users. Users. Um, a little bit about me first off. Um, does this work? Yeah, you guys can see my screen, right? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. All right. I So I had uh, just quick, like two second story time. Uh, I gave a flash talk version of this, which is just really like a, a crash course, uh, 15 minutes. It was not, not <laughs> at ETH Denver. Um, and I had so little time, I just kind of launched into it. And after the 15 minutes were up, I thought to myself, like I had no idea did they, could they even hear me? Was the screen going? I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the recording because I'm terrified to like find out. There's like, oh no, you were sharing your email screen instead of your, your screen. So with a little bit more time, I want to give myself some time to make sure that people can hear me and they can see me and all that. Um, so about me, I'm a product and design founder and then a product strategist. Um, what does a strategist mean? It's just a fancy way of saying I help teams get out of their own way. I look at the problem from outside of their own head. I help them prioritize the most important things and ignore the rest. Um, I've done... A uh, decent amount in Web2, some pixelated logos because of NDAs, MuleSoft, GE, R&D, Dell EMC, Ellie Mae, Sovereign, Survey Gizmo. Um, I think like the theme that you'll see here is that it's none of it is very like B to C. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to like make the next Snapchat or TikTok or whatever. I'm very much about like building tools for people um, that deliver value to them. So very much like that's kind of my perspective. In Web3, I have been, uh, I've really had an amazing opportunity to work with some amazing teams. Um, 
three bucks, which is now I think three bucks labs, atomic finance, which is now atomic finance. I obviously need to update this deck. I just haven't had a chance to, I apologize. Um, a whole bunch of teams in the space, protocol labs, are we Afogato, consensus. Um, I just finished a study with Bitcoin core. So like the team that's actually, or not finished, sorry. Uh, we were working on like kind of the first user study for Bitcoin core, the people who are building um, like the software and, and, and that runs Bitcoin. And so it's really, really cool. Um, so I've had, a, I've had the opportunity to be in a lot of different spaces, um, which has been really cool. I've been really thankful of that. Um, generally speaking, whenever I work with these early, early companies or we're working for teams or like projects within the space, um, there's kind of like a pretty high threshold to getting from zero to one. That's an incredible sort of, of leap, right? You have something, it's really cool. How do you find that first that first user? Um, and I think like more importantly, like why are we calling them mythical, right? Uh, it's a kind of a tongue in cheek, tongue in cheek title, um, but I think it's really important to consider, right? That you know, if you go to, I, I may, I originally gave this talk in October. Um, 2020. If you go to DAP Radar, um, you'll see a pretty substantial drop off, drop off from one to four. Um, one, you know, we were seeing like almost 500k MAUs. This is over 30 day rolling activity. Um, and then if you get down to four, you'll see 30k uh, monthly active users. This is actually pretty small for a web two for kind of like a using like a web two metric. I think that really just kind of shows how early we all are in the space and how I think like just kind of like how constrained the pie is within crypto users uh, in general. If you continue to go down 36 to 40, um, I would consider these like some of these to be blue chip kind of projects, right? I have a tremendous amount of respect for Zapper, for Tornado, for CryptoKitties. I haven't used, no offense if, if you're, if Meme Limited or Lua Swap uh, is in the audience, I've not used them, so I don't have an opinion on them. It's not that I'm downplaying them. Um, but even these like kind of, I would consider like really impressive projects are at least in October, 2020, clocking in at about 1.9 active users uh, a month, which is pretty small, right? Um, and when I gave this talk in October, I was updating things. I thought to myself, okay, but we're in a bull market. Surely things have like grown. Actually, bull run hasn't necessarily improved things. Um, if the, this was taken say, February 7th, uh, a couple of days ago, um, and if you look at this, the numbers have actually dropped. Uniswap has grown, right? They were at, I think, two, 220, 250 uh, in October. They're up to 340 in their number one slot. Um, but Unlike the previous one, you'll see here, right? Like uh, you had to go down four spaces to get sub 100K MAUs. In this one, your second slot is sub 100K. So um, I honestly think it probably has something to do with fees. Uh, people have noted that like if you're not moving more than five figures or less than five figures around, it's almost not worth it uh, given like gas, high gas fees and everything. Um, and I'm kind of wondering that's constraining the growth of DAP users. Um, but so it's it's just something to consider. I also liked this tweet from uh, Rick Burton, literally, and, you know, enough to include it in the talk, um, is that there's only around, uh, as of November 2020, there's only around 30 ERC-20 con uh, contracts that have more than 50 daily active addresses interacting with them. Um, this goes to show you how early Ethereum is, which is all to really say, like, oh, you know, first a disclaimer, right? It's all to really say that, like, it's still a pretty small pie um, success of Ethereum in denominated by USDs doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to uh, mean more users, right? Um, and so we have to think in terms of like an active context of growing the pie um, for ourselves and for the products that we're building. Um, and then of course, like a disclaimer, a disclaimer kind of personally, um, user acquisition encompasses a lot and I'm familiar with a sliver. Like if you think of the hierarchy of growth, right? Like I'm... I'm kind of a barbell sort of founder, right? Like I either go, I'm user research plus biz dev. So I'm like at like the zero users to the 10 users to the 15 to 20. Once you start hitting like the 50 user mark, you have to start thinking about scaling that and like getting an actual incoming pipeline of people who make that decision. Um, that's sort of the marketing slot. That's really not something I'm super familiar with. You can find hundreds and hundreds of books around that and also just meet some amazing marketing professionals, both in the Web 2 and Web 3 space. Uh, and then, of course, like around the community piece. Um, and this is where you start converting people from uh, customers into evangelists, uh, which is like one of the most effective ways to grow your user base. Um, and I'm, pr I'm pretty good at that. Pretty good at community, really good at the user research and biz dev. So I kind of want to set that context. I'm not an expert at, uh, of this at a whole, more at this specific stage in a company's life cycle. Um, so what are we covering? Some assumptions. 
one, you get a product and it works and it's ready for users. And I want to like really underline, I'm assuming that this is where we are in the customers in the, in the life stage of your product. You should be talking to customers and users before you even write a line of code. Um, this is something that can be like kind of taken and appropriated for much earlier in the cycle. But I'm just assuming that the people that I'm talking to right now, um, you've got a product that works. It's ready for users. Um, you've already onboarded your friends and family and everybody who owes you a favor. And then you spend a lot of time onboarding them, learning about the rough patches in your product and smoothing them out. Why is that? Because even, I would say, even amazing designers and amazing, amazing engineers are going to build things that don't account for edge, the edge cases of people using them. Um, and it's better to make those kind of like obvious dumb mistakes in front of f friends and family and people that owe you favors as opposed to strangers, right? Because your friends and family, they like you and they want you to su succeed. So pardon me, they're going to give you a lot of time uh, in order to like work those things out and really get the product heuristically as tight and as constrained and, and as focused, I think, around the problem set as possible. Um, this isn't just for like, you know, some, something something that you're working on in your garage and you're sort of like, oh, this could be cool. Like real companies have used the friends and family method um, to bootstrap their network. Slack, uh, I love this story from Slack, right? Begged and cajoled our friends at other companies to try it out and give us feedback. We had maybe t six to 10 companies that we found this way. Um, this is like, this is a, an effective strategy that works, especially if you have kind of a deep network. But what we'll be covering is let's say you've already exhausted the friends and family route. You've already learned everything that you can from them. Um, we're going to be covering how to meet people you previously didn't know, how to talk to them about what you're building, how to pitch them on giving your product a, a chance, and then how to make the most of these chances strangers take on your product. So um, last year, shoot, was it year? Last year I gave a talk, um, with Katie about built early product design. Um, this is how I think about early product design, um, in that, like, you're always, you're taking time to understand the problem, define, ideate, prototype, and then evaluate. The understanding of the evaluation is really the two steps that we're playing with here as we build our customer base out. And each one of these activities is meant to move us further along and up to the right on the chart of certainty, right? Um, why do we want to get more and more certain? I don't know, because building a fully fledged product can take months of your life. Uh, and if you take months of your life building something, it could be right on the market, could be completely way off, way off to the side and completely missing it. Um, but you're not going to know until you actually get it in front of people and start listening to what they have to say. And I would say that it's more important to get that out of the way early than later because it's it's just it's an incredibly laborious activity building software, especially software that scales. If you can prototype something out in a week, I usually say like a weekend to test an idea out. If you can't build a co in code what that week uh, in that weekend to test it out, go even more further back into smoke and mirrors. But it's important, right? It's important to validate your ideas and make sure that the market is there. So. Um, and I have links to like a ton of extra reading if this is interesting to you in uh, in this talk. So I'll I'll share a a copy of the deck in the Slack. Um, I would say someone who has like another interesting kind of point of view on this is the mom test by Rob Fitzpatrick. Um, I hadn't really seen people kind of take this double dipping approach. I hadn't really seen people talk about this in this manner until I found this book, which was really, really exciting. Um, so I would strongly recommend if this resonates with you or you think to yourself, wow, I really want to learn more. Uh, first step, first stop I would say would be uh, read the mom test. Um, from that perspective, I think, especially Rob, he's, he's kind of a multi, uh, multi exit entrepreneur. And so there's really good insights here as well. Um, and also to say this is counterintuitive, especially in crypto. Um, if you all lived through the summer of DeFi that was 2020, then this like slow and steady, uh, does not feel like it wins the race because we saw people YOLO smart contracts out, uh, over a weekend and then get a billion dollars worth of money locked into it. So why would I take this kind of slow and steady, uh, wins the race? Well, I mean, first off, it's it's definitely more difficult to repeat this. Second off, um, builders like Andre have like spent time building up reputation to where they already have people who are signed up. Um, and third off, you know, if you can YOLO something and get a billion dollars in value locked up and users and everything, like maybe this isn't the talk for you. Maybe I should be learning from you. Um, so this is just like something to consider. 
this is not where the hype is, but I think that this is actually where most of the growth is going to come from. Um, and also, like, again, I wrote this talk in October. It was really, really gratifying in January to see Andre write an essay that basically says building in DeFi stocks, real users are scarce. And if you build something, you want people to use it. So even like it was kind of one of those nice moments of like, oh, wow, even rock stars put their pants on one leg at a time. Even people who don't have the same problems that you do and are, can essentially start later in the stack as you still are frustrated with the lack of users and with building uh, user bases for their products. So all this to say, this is still irrelevant. Um, so takeaway number one, I think that you should have is know where your users are. Um, I tend to think of it in terms of open channels and closed channels. You'll get significantly different conversations in both of those, which I think are pretty powerful. Open channels are defined as something like Reddit or Twitter or Stack Overflow. These are basic where basically like open indexable uh, discussions um, where you can you, you essentially like people are using their outside voice. They're saying things that if you know I Googled you, I w wouldn't necessarily reflect negatively on your professional career. Career Closed channels are Telegram, Discord, anything that's closed. I think Clubhouse would probably be added to this um, to this as well, especially given how if, uh, ephemeral uh, the discussions are. Um, both are really, really valuable. Open channels are really helpful because it teaches you on how to, how people are essentially like talking about their profession when they know other people are watching. Closed channels are how, are almost like water cooler talk. Uh, how people are talking to, about their problems um, when they don't think other people are watching. Um, and both are really, really helpful. Um, you can take the quantity of conversations as a signal for overall market size. Um, something that I have noticed is whenever we tell people to go find people to go talk to, we found people to go talk to. Some people have said something along the lines of like, okay, you know, I spent some time Googling, Googling around. I couldn't find people talking about, you know, specifically the problem that I'm working on. That's not a good sign. <laughs> I mean, and you have to think in terms of like second and third order effects, right? If you're building something for this specific problem, you don't need to look for people looking like talking about the problem, but maybe the secondary order of effects. But if you can't find that, then maybe think about doing some exploratory interviews and talking about what problems actually do affect them. Um, take what is being discussed as the direction of the market. Um, and then it's both easier and more difficult now uh, than pre-COVID. It's easier now because everything has moved online. Um, it's much more difficult now because everything has moved online. Um, my inbox is just like a tragedy right now because I've got so many emails, of people like trying to tell me about things that are happening or, you know, or we're launching these products and whatever. Um, so you will find the noise to signal ratio has climbed dramatically uh, due to COVID, which just means you have to get more creative. Um, all that to say though, that these communities are self-curating. Um, Ross Simmons uh, is a great marketer. He's basically talking about how you can use use Reddit um, as a way to kind of like hack, um, figure out like where the conversations are going. And then he kind of builds his marketing approach around kind of leading these leading trends uh, in these communities, which I thought was a really smart way, really smart way to think about things. Um, a personal uh, trick that I really like is called Twitter phishing. Um, I use TweetDeck. That's really the only way I use Twitter. Um, but you can basically use TweetDeck to program it to look for anyone talking about anything around a whole bunch of different uh, contexts. Um, and it's fantastic, right? Like you can use uh, keywords, hashtags, you can limit responses, you can only sort for highest engagement uh, to kind of like control for quality, pardon me, quality. Um, it's just really nice. It's a, it's, a, it's a great way. And so let's say like hypothetically, I was going to be building um, an NFT onboarding uh, an app, right? Um, I spent about 20 seconds finding, uh, back in October, finding a tweet uh, where someone had difficulty with this, with onboarding on NFTs. Um, it's really that simple. Like that's how you start monitoring the conversations and that's how you can start ask, uh, start introducing yourself to people you didn't previously know. Um, my first, you know, my first um, knee jerk reaction. And I think a lot of people's is to just like, you know, jump in and start, uh, start shilling, uh, I think is, is kind of like how people think about it. Um, I would strongly recommend against this. this is actually bad. Don't do this. Um, this is the equivalency of like being at a bar and overhearing a couple of people talk about star Wars and then like, kind of like edging your way in and going like, excuse me, I have very strong opinions about this and I'm going to subject you to them. Um, people don't like 
this type of shilling. I've had it happen to me multiple times on Twitter. I have muted people who has, I, if I don't know them, I've muted them. Um, because I'm just like, I don't, this is, it's only ancillary related. You didn't spend any time understanding my problem. Like, why did you do this? Sometimes it's actually really useful. I think it's, but, but uh, other times I feel like whenever they didn't take time to understand my problem, like, what's the point? It's just, it's just kind of a, um, it's just it's just a shill, right? Um, which takes us to our second takeaway, which is ask for advice, not for a sale. Um, and this is where we get into the double dipping with user interviews and business development. Um, oh, and just again, more resources, cold calling for introverts. Um, this is Jay and Katie. Um, I'm not an uh, extrovert. I'm an introvert, um, which is to say I like talking to people, but I don't derive energy from it. I actually derive energy from like reading and quiet and that sort of thing. Um, cold calling for introverts is in my opinion, like one of the best videos I've watched and I'm not biased. I am biased, but, uh, it, it's one of the best, best videos I've watched from two, I would say consummate professionals. Jay is a uh, UX researcher in at Facebook. Katie is now at Google, um, as a, as a UX researcher, both incredible professionals, um, talking about what goes into, um, finding people who you need to talk to and getting those insights, uh, and getting in front of them. So I strongly recommend watching this, uh, at some point in the future too. And this is also linked. Um, so remember that previous, the previous, uh, uh introduction kind of ham fisted introduction I did. What if instead we asked for advice, we empathized, we said, Hey, that really sucks. Um, I kind of been having some of the same experiences. Do you have like 15 or 20 minutes to maybe chat. I'd love to talk to you about kind of your experiences and how they could possibly be better. I'm kind of like noodling around with something that might, that might be positively affecting this. This is too long for a tweet, but you kind of get my impression or you get, you get the idea of like what I'm going for. Right. Um, at this point in your product's life cycle, insights are much more important than payments. Right. Um, if you, get some, if you convince someone to onboard, remember whenever I, I was talking about like, you know, the obvious edge cases, um, Whenever you get people to try out a product without necessarily vetting the experience, you're almost always optimizing for one-time use. Um, insights are much more important than payments. If someone's going to spend like twenty bucks or fifty bucks, um, you know, just to test out your your product, that's not going to be nearly as useful as them using the product or just telling you about their product from their perspective, or or sorry, telling you about their the problem from their perspective. That's actually going to give you insights that are actionable. Um, Customer interviews can be anything from five minutes to 50 minutes. Um, they can be longer than 50 minutes, but I think once you get to like the 50 minutes to an hour mark, you need to start thinking about compensating them for their time. Um, it's easy to overthink. Uh, it really just boils down to asking questions and listening to users. Um, the interview, it just don't make it overly academic. You're exploring the problem from their space. Um, from their perspective and looking for opportunities to deliver value. So um, there's there's a ton of study in here. I link to a ton of uh, a ton of stuff. When people ask me like what the eighty twenty is for product design, um, it's not usability tests in my opinion. Um, it is this. Like if if you could take no other thing from product design, um, I would say these sort of early uh, research and co design sessions are where much of the value is um, because one it saves you a ton of time. Uh, from building the wrong thing. I've seen teams waste six months, 12 months, 24 months building the wrong thing um, before they talk to a user. Uh, it gives you valuable insights. You can, I, you know, we all like to think that we have the idea that nobody else has had. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that everyone is kind of having the same ideas in the same space, right? We're all kind of reading the same crypto Twitter, the same newsletters, the same blogs. So you can almost guarantee that whatever you're working on, there's probably three to five other teams working on the same things. It's the way you win is not by having a better idea than anybody else. The way you win is by executing against that idea and having unique insights uh, that nobody else has, has uncovered. And that requires work. That requires talking to people and it requires study and research, which thankfully in crypto uh, we love doing. But this is my opinion is, is how you kind of uh, you transition this from like a fun exploration into like a product or a business. So the interview structure, explore the problem space, 80% of the total time. You should spend most of your time listening to these person, to these people and asking questions. And then you test the value pitch, so 20% of the time total. Um, explore the problem space 80% of the time. Five whys, which is just to say when someone asks something, you can use this really simple way to kind of dig deeper and deeper, which is just basically asking a question why. If I was doing an NFT um, 
onboarding, like here's here, fun hypothetical, right? I was doing the NFT uh, exploratory research and he said, yeah, I was just like, I was trying to onboard into this NFT platform. And it was really frustrating. Oh, I mean, well, why was it frustrating? He was like, well, because, you know, I only had my wallet on my hot wallet on my mobile phone um, and they were requiring a desktop. Oh, that's interesting. Like, why were you, why didn't you have your desktop handy? Oh, because like I told, like I was on vacation, which was an example that worked in the before times, but I was on vacation. Um, and I told my, you know, I told my partner that I would leave my, my laptop at home and we were out and, uh, I, I really wanted to like get, interact with this NFT platform. I was like, okay, why were you trying to interact with an NFT platform on your vacation? It was like, oh, because we went to this art gallery. We saw a whole bunch of art. I was kind of inspired to explore the space. Right. Those five whys kind of continue to dig down. You're like not, it started at the, what I've seen time and time again, again, whenever you start with the five whys, is you go from the technical constraints, which are really like, they're easy to kind of latch onto. They're like, oh, these are just engineering problems that we can fix. But as you continue to five whys, you kind of like continue to go down into the problem stack into like the inciting incident for why they wanted the thing in the first place. And that will actually give you really interesting insights. We know that one, he needs you know, like desktop, he prefers something on his mobile phone. But even more than that, like real art has inspired him to look at NFT, at digital art or crypto art. That might give you some interesting ideas of like partnering with local museums, et cetera, et cetera. Like the, and that was purely hypothetical, but that really, I think is a pretty good to like summarization of how these type of conversations tend to go. They shouldn't be super focused on it. They should be exploring the problem space from their perspective. So that means you want to get all of the context and really look on the periphery as well. So be curious, let them speak. Um, I know a lot of people, especially if you're building something that you love or really excited about, you want to talk to them about it, but do not talk to them about your idea. Why? Because it can bias them about it. You want to learn from their perspective before you introduce them to their idea because otherwise subconsciously or, uh, or, uh, uh, or consciously, they're going to start giving you um, what you want to hear if you kind of preface it with what you're building, right? Um, record and take good notes. Um, I would recommend, oh yeah, and, be, uh, and bring a friend. So uh, really, uh, really listening is difficult. Uh, I just finished an amazing book, uh, Never Split the Difference, um, in which he talks about how FBI negotiations, they have five people just listening. And it, because it's really difficult to actively have a conversation process what they're saying and then continue to lead the conversation and pick up on all of the subtext in which they're dropping. So if you have a co-founder or a partner, um, I would recommend bringing them, let them take notes as you lead the interview and then discuss afterwards to kind of like help, uh, synthesize those, those findings. Um, Here's another example. Uh, this is kind of, I would also strongly recommend having a script to normalize the data. You don't want these conversations to be open-ended. You need to start them with like, this is what we need to, this is what I'm really interested in learning and then have questions around it and then run each of the interviews based off of that. Here's an example script uh, that Katie and I wrote. Uh, you can download this off of GitHub um, and then value pitch last 20%. Um, People tend to think, oh, cool, 20% of the time I can talk about what I'm building. Wrong. 20% of the time is the space that you allow for this, but it's actually you're going to be spending 30 seconds on an elevator pitch about what the product that you're building, okay? Um, it needs to basically be the structure is an elevator pitch, and then it's an ask toward the end goal. Um, and then that's different if your end goal is revenue or user growth, et cetera. Um, and then you want to end with a skin in the game signal. One of the biggest mistakes I see whenever people start trying this out is kind of a, uh, an open-ended, well, what do you think? What do you think is a terrible question to ask um, because A, even if they're strangers, they're going to subconsciously want you to like them or they're going to want you to succeed or, or like they're people are nice people like they were social creatures. Um, and also it's not very specific. So generally speaking, if you say like, what do you think of this? You're probably going to hear something from, uh, anywhere from like, this is pretty cool to this is pretty interesting. Um, it doesn't really give you much to go on, um, unfortunately. Uh, I think instead what's more interesting is you need to start testing out essentially the value exchange um, that you're going to need customers to start to, to start like actually interacting with. So um, at the end of it, you can say something to the effect of like, you know, I would love to sign you. Like if this sounds interesting, I'd love to sign you up for a beta. And, you know, we can onboard you and then kind of like show you what you're working, what we're working on in 30 days. Um, or sign you up for a mailing list, or do you have people that you would, that might be interested uh, that you could introduce us to if, if your goals are community or user growth? Um, all of these to say, like, you want to test to make sure that there's enough value there for them to want to hear more about the product and give you either their email or their beta or uh, like their, their attention uh, at a future date, et cetera. 
Um, if they say no, that's actually almost probably maybe even better than if they say yes. And why is that? Because if they say no, you can actually start digging into what about your value pitch is wrong. Um, I, usually I thank them. <laughs> I thank them for saying no, because that means that they're honest enough with me to tell me the truth. Um, and then I say like, what about this? Do you feel like is, is misaligned? Um, and you know, they may say like, well, I think you're, you're kind of targeting, uh, I, this has happened in interviews before where they say like, you're really kind of focusing on this type of users. Whereas I'm, you know, like I am this other type of users, you know, I'm, I'm more, um, you know, I'm more post-market, you're looking at pre-market. Like I found out that I was thinking about the wrong customer base from these interviews, which has been fantastic. Um, and then finally, takeaway number three, build relationships and then communities. Um, if you think about how these have been ramping, it's listing to the conversations, asking for advice, and then building kind of an ongoing exchange of dialogue. Value it. Exchange is a two-way street. Do stuff for free. Um, Co-creation with users, I have found curiously missing from web two as well as web three, which I think is really interesting. Um, if I find people who are really, really keyed up on the problem space itself, and they say like, oh my God, the fact that you're even thinking about solving this makes me really excited. I want this yesterday. And you will find those people. And that is uh, hands down, uh, one of the most fun things whenever you're doing these kind of research uh, of, of user kind of customer development is finding people who are excited that you are working in this space. Um, if they are that excited, then I say like, would you be up for another 30 minutes? Um, I would love to like actually just spend some time sketching out the interface with you. Um, this can be done IRL. It can also be done in Figma, but it's really just walking through um, what the interface would look like, what the flows would look like from their perspective. That'll actually give you a much more informed uh, much more informed design. And I'm not saying this needs to be your final design, but I am saying that it needs, it's a good way, um, some old school user, uh, user research, uh, sorry, user uh, UX design methodology is like card sorting to like prioritize data. Um, this is a set effectively like card sorting, but with the interface and with the flow itself, which has been really, uh, which is really, really effective. Um, I'm not a huge fan of usability tests done in isolation. I don't think you should just like, design a thing and then put it in front of somebody. And then like, that's a very like stop and go. Um, it's a very stop and go uh, uh, feedback loop. Um, think of it in terms of micro experiences. So let's say you're thinking about delivering a new feature set. Um, you can think if there are ways to chunk it off and make it like a separate micro experience, um, something that people can use without using the rest of your product. That's also a really powerful way um, to start building sort of a value exchange with people and, and building out that that uh, uh, that beta list. Um, and then finally, industry reports. And I think, honestly, Web3 Crypto um, is better about this than uh, Web2, just because A, it's a smaller space, so not as many people are thinking about it, but then B, um, I feel like engineers and, and people in crypto like to think a lot and research a lot about the problems in their space. Um, and so think about abstracting them out and turning them into things in which your customers can find useful um, and ways in which they can kind of grow their own practice, grow their own business. So remember, it's a value for value exchange. How do you know what people need? This is done via the conversations and monitoring monitoring and, and following the conversations uh, in open and closed channels, as well as one-on-one -on -one customer interviews. Um, I, you know, I, before COVID, uh, an email signup didn't feel like a big thing. Now it does. Um, I think twice, maybe even three times whenever someone asks for my email now, just because I'm thinking like, oh man, do I really want more emails? Um, it's got to be something like the, the bar for email signups has definitely risen. And the only way that you're going to get to that is by thinking about ways that you can deliver value before you even ask them for an email signup. Um, communities, the new mode is really good. Uh, Astasia Myers wrote this. Um, I think this is sort of like moving up the stack. Um, like once you kind of onboard them as users, you start thinking about them as community members. Crypto, I think, is actually amazing at doing this. Um, or there are projects within the crypto space that are really, really good about doing that, especially um, when you have tokens that can kind of like symbolize um, that like skin in the game, like actual investment within the community. Um, and it's also one of the most important things to do in the crypto space because everything's open source, everything's opt-in, everything's open protocols, meaning um, it's much more difficult to build a moat um, in anything other than uh, user investment. Um, linked in the appendix, Scott Galloway, um, who's been making the news for, I would consider, not great opinions. Um, he, I think, is actually a brilliant market analyst and uh, marketing um, marketing brain. Um, he had a really good, I think, two years ago, started talking about kind of how Amazon was destroying brand loyalty. Um, 
And I think that that's going to continue to be true, that people are less loyal to brands, more loyal to the people that they know building the products on um, the people they know in the space. So definitely check this out. Um, finally, be creative, iterate and find your own strategy. Um, these are starting points. Um, one of the disconnects I found is one of my hand people, um, I hand people playbooks and they start working through them and then they realize that like, there's not a one for one relationship to what they're building. Um, and so they kind of stop and they say like, well, I tried this and it didn't work or I couldn't find an open community or I couldn't do this. Um, these are supposed to be starting points. Um, and I think in order to build a company, uh, a product with users, you have to fall in love as much with understanding the customer base and understanding and like building the customer base out as you do with building the code. Um, you can't build something unique just by copy and pasting user acquisition strategies um, any more than you can build, you know, revolutionary tech by copy and pasting from Stack Overflow, right? Like you have to think creatively and you have to iterate on this. Um, this list isn't exhaustive. Um, this is, I really enjoy this. Do things that don't scale, I think is a great example of early successful companies, how they have thought about user acquisition and, custom, and, and growth uh, in this context. I would recommend like, don't go too far down this rabbit hole um, because you can kind of get too easily distracted from other people's stories. Um, but if you need like some ideas or, or kind of riff something to bounce off of, this is a good, good place to start. Um, and then finally, further reading. So about user research and business dev, dev, cold calling for introverts, the mom test by Rob Fitzpatrick was fantastic. About marketing, um, this is marketing by Seth Godin. Um, I read that because I want to get better at marketing. Um, I read this uh, thinking it was going to be a mar about marketing. I think what and it, it ended up just being an amazing book on product. I, Seth Godin's, I think, take on on good marketing is just building an amazing product. And so uh, definitely check that out. I think it's a fantastic book. Um, Microclass Brand Strategy and How Amazon is Dismantling Retail are um, fantastic lectures by Scott Galloway. Um, to Sell a Human uh, by Daniel H. Pink is fantastic, especially if you're someone who doesn't necessarily consider yourself in sales or marketing. Um, that's a really good book in order to like, I think properly frame the activity of sales and marketing, which really aren't sales or marketing. It's just listening to people, figuring out what their problems are and then building towards those problems. Um, about community building, I don't think there's anyone better in the crypto space uh, building communities than Peter Pan. And I think he's talking at Kernel, um, which is great. Maybe not about community building, but uh, about something else. Peter's amazing. Um, although I think obviously there are other amazing folks, uh, Yalor uh, at Gitcoin, I would consider also uh, kind, of, kind of like top tier. So definitely talk to them. Um, communities in a new moat. Uh, case study indie hackers. I think indie hackers is a fascinating uh, st place to study. It's a fascinating case study because indie hackers, um, the community is the product with indie hackers. Um, and so I think it's worth really diving into why that was successful. Um, and then finally, working in public by Nadia, um, who uh, this is essentially about like community building in the open source space at GitHub. Um, I believe that's it. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, I was planning on, yeah, I was planning on spending about 40, 45, 40 minutes. Um, if there's Q and A's, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I also recognize that work time, uh, is, uh, hard to come by these days. So, um, let's, I, I'm sorry. I hide the interfaces of these things so that I can like focus on what I'm talking about. So I have not read the chats. If there are chats, oh, here we go. Here's Q and A. Yeah. Um, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, the, the last question was from a while ago, so we can maybe hop back to it in a second. But the first question, definitely the link to the presentation would be great. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me just do that right now before I forget, guys. Um, oh, yeah. And if there are any other questions that folks have, feel free to post them in the chat. Yeah, the link to the reading recommendations page is coming. There we go. Um, oh. And that's slide uh, slide forty four on the deck. Awesome and cool. Yeah, the one question was a while ago from Urban, but I think he he liked the tweet deck that you recommended. If you have any other tools that that you'd recommend for Twitter, and I think there was some chatter around that time about the approach to replying and 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 a lot of people who are like thinking about that as a good approach. Um, I mean, I guess I would say, what are you trying, what, yeah, what are you using it for? Mm -hmm. Um, right. Like I, I, like TweetDeck to me, I'm sure there are other tools that like, 
present like the stream of like what is being said in a certain context and all of that. I, I'm, they're probably paid for. TweetDeck is free. Um, but if there's other pieces to it that are important, like measuring engagement or like scheduling or all those others, I guess there's a, um, I, I guess the short answer is no, I can't really think of anything that does what TweetDeck does as well and is free. Mm -hmm. uh, but if he has like, if, or if they have like, um, like specific needs or use cases that they, uh, that they have with that, maybe, maybe I can think of like something more specifically. Sure. Sure. If Irvin has anything in the chat, we can check. And then one from Peter that just came in. How do you start a user interview without describing your product? First? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so uh, it's actually, so in the deck, I think in, there is brr, 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 slide 37. We have like a, we have an example. Um, generally speaking, what you do is you set up the context of you, you, you lay out the, the rules of the interview. First off, you say like, first off, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thrilled that you're here. Really appreciate the time. Um, just like kind of so to let you know, I've kind of been exploring the the problem space and sort of thinking in these terms, but I don't want to tell you, you like can literally say, I don't want to tell you anything about it because I don't want to bias you about it because you will find people say like, they'll, they'll be like, so like, tell me about your thing. And you'd be like, eh, not yet. Um, and so you can, you basically say, I don't want to tell you anything about it because I'm afraid it might bias you. I really want to hear kind of an unfiltered perspective uh, from you, like the problem that you're experiencing and, and how you're thinking about it. And then I promise, you basically say like, I promise at the end, like the last five minutes, I'll tell you what it is because I really, I'm really curious to get your, your feedback on it. But first off, I just want to hear about the problem space from your perspective. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Vivek, I think you're on mute if you're speaking anyway. Yeah, I was just checking if there are any other questions. Um, I think we're um, Yeah, so I agree with Charles. Like, this was one of the best talk ever. So. I'm glad to hear it. Um, I'm just, like, scrolling through the chat. Man, there's a lot of really good mm -hmm. good, good discussion here, guys. I'm kind of sad I had to give the talk. It'd be more interesting oh. reading this. <laughs> um um, I'm glad to hear that y'all getting uh, Peter in. He's brilliant. Um, this is this is really good. Yeah, the UI stuff. Um, let's see. Great point. I've gotten great feedback on UI. By saying, yes, agreed. Um, UI, especially, I think with Figma and other things, like it could be a little bit more asynchronous. Um, but I would also recommend. Uh, depending on like, this is kind of falls into the usability test thing, but, um, think in terms of like, what's the most important thing that you want people to be able to accomplish in the interface and like test against those pieces as well is also really, really helpful. Um, but the, just like making sense is also really, really useful. Um, let's see, Marina, how do you deal with clients that want your influencer magic to the high growth and recruit the mythical dab user, but don't have the patience for the user research and community building you recommend? Um, I tell them that what they want is wrong. <laughs> um, you're going to see this a lot. Uh, people look at research as a, it's like, I mean, so forgive me for being a little uh, crass here, but like they look at it as like cover your own ass insurance, right? Like people don't actually look at research as like, oh, we can find out things that are really going to positively impact uh, the, the product in like really powerful or compelling ways. They think of it in terms of like, like how do we check to make sure we're not wrong is really how research is viewed. Um, and if they have that type of, if they have that type of opinion, like you can either say like something to the effect of like, look, I, I, I recognize, you know, um, I can appreciate that you want to move fast. Like, first off, again, um, I would recommend, I just finished the book, uh, Never Split the Difference. It's about negotiations. Um, it's actually about hostage negotiations, but it's how it applies to business. Um, I would recommend that because a lot of these kind of difficult conversations that you can be having with people um, are, I think, actually like really, really well understood from like the, the negotiation standpoint. Everything that you're doing is essentially negotiation. You're trying to understand what they're trying to accomplish from their perspective. And then you're trying, then you're essentially like figuring out ways in which you can present the methodology that you're that you're using or like the product like kind of i guess the product strategy that you're using in such a way that it actually reinforces their goals right if someone was like yeah well, we just don't have time to do research i would just say like i you know i completely appreciate that you know we all you know we i i design i specifically design research around um the runway that teams have um 
what I'm thinking of is not a six month process. It's honestly about a week process, a week to two week process. And just to tell you what's happened in the past, like I have saved these teams, like these teams have done this and we have saved six months worth of runway building the right thing as opposed to the wrong thing. And so um, I, it's my intention of going fast. And that's why I'm proposing maybe a week of really digging in and understanding this problem. Something like that, I think is, is really, really effective uh, in communicating the danger. People like tend to negotiate. They tend to like push against this idea of research um, aggressively because they think that researchers like research. Like if you just gave them a bag of money and said, go research this, they're going to go off and just like do a ton of research and a ton of research. And then never going to actually like come back with like actionable things. And they're going to say, that's enough research. Let's go. Let's move forward. What your goal is, is to communicate to them that your goal isn't to do a bunch of research. Your goal is to make them successful. And the only way you can make them successful is by answering these questions and ensuring that we're building the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. The, there has been some more chatter in the chat about the, uh, the comic book that you've, you've written, Zach. So oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's maybe, maybe we can say that for the last. There's one more question that we can get to, which is, uh, has to do with how to build community before a product release. Um, Peter's session is in 10 minutes, which would be fun. Um, oh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, like, especially around, like, this research process as a as a means to build community might be an, an interesting like take that you have, Zach. And, and this one's from Mika at Nari Dao. Cool. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think so. There's a there's a couple of different ways that you can do it, right? People communities are essentially people who gather to discuss things, right? Um, and and help each other. Like that's that's really like people like talking. It's people finding like people that they want to discuss and maybe like share and find. Um, and so if you're building a product around it, uh, around like that community, I mean, the first thing that you could start doing is really just asking questions and then gathering people and, and uh, giving people a space to discuss. Um, I, I think, uh, ironically, teams in the Arweave ecosystem are, I think, really almost preternaturally good at building a community while they build the product. Um, I've seen so many so many teams where they just start a discord and they start gathering people in the space, like talking about it. And then as the discussions grow, they build the, community, the discussion off of that. There tends to have to be like some sort of locus of focus though. Um, you know, that can be a, a one day conference that can be a discord community that can be just a telegram. I think I, you know, uh, I think Meta Cartel just started as a Telegram chat, right? Like it was Peter thought there wasn't enough being done in terms of growth and UX, so he started the Meta Cartel, which started as like L two, like a gas station, like L two uh, uh, L two solutions, and sort of grew into like this this more more of a discussion around like the actual ecosystem health and like how to help people build useful things in the space. Um, actually, so yeah, I mean, like first off, Meta Cartel was a community before they were a series of grants or funds or anything like that. So that to me would be like a good first step as well. It kind of depends on like what your product is and like what people are wanting to discuss. It's really like, if you're building like a tax art product, it's really difficult to build a community around that because people don't want to think about their taxes outside of, outside of, you know, a month before they have to file them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So then the last question for you, for after a lot of positive comments on your comic book, which is like, I didn't know that you wrote. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> you collect comics. Uh, Ethan says an NFT comic project would be fun. Uh, he mentions masterworks for comics and nfts would be cool oh, interesting yeah i so i've thought i have i went on a run a couple of days ago and wrote down like five different nft comic sort of things right what mirror is doing uh in the blogging space is really interesting how they kind of like pre-run they pre-sell essays or like revenue based off of essays like something like that would be really interesting especially since building comic or making comics is like such a high uh high resource cap like it's like usually two to three people you have to pay them ahead of time nfts would be really interesting i thought uh it would be really interesting to do like a choose your own adventure um there's a guy who runs a comic book on twitter that's really interesting he'll like he'll draw up like 
couple of pages and then he'll have a Twitter poll saying like, what should happen next? So like, what if you did a comic where you sold you like pre-sold revenue for that next comic based off of the turn it takes? So I was like, which way do you think this story would be more interesting? You know, w- would you go w- like, should it, should a happen or should B happen? And then the people who like buy the most of a or B uh, uh, have like the tokens for that run and then the rest is refunded. Like that could be a really interesting thing. Um, I think a lot about imbuement, uh, like the imbuement, um, uh, cognitive uh, psychology thing in terms of uh, NFTs where like people value things more highly if they feel like they have partial ownership in it. Um, I think that is going to be really like a, I know generative art is the big thing in NFTs, but I think co-creation could be a huge thing in NFTs. Like you can buy a piece of art for like one ETH or you can change the piece of art and mint a brand new piece of art, which is you in a collaboration with another artist uh, for like five ETH or something like that, and then resell it or something. I think there's like something there that I haven't quite worked out yet, but, uh, but yeah, collecting comics would be uh, really like an interesting way to go with that. I thought I've got another comic I'm working on uh, called neon noir, which is like a cyberpunk thing. And I thought about minting some NFTs off of that. Um, I don't know. It's a lot, a lot to do, a lot to experiment with for sure. Definitely. Zach, I just added you to the stories channel in Colonel Slack. You might oh, heck yeah. the last three posts, which is a experiment in co-creation. Um, Ooh. Second, if anyone else is interested as well. One follow up from Ethan was, do you, do you collect physical comics? Not physical? Uh, uh, I'm an apartment dweller who has in the last five years moved three times. So I do collect comics, but it's a box. Um, it's a box uh, that I've continuously whittled down and then like one bookshelf, um, probably would collect more if I could stay at one place, but, uh, but no, I actually, and I prefer digital comics at this point, um, comiXology and, and, uh, image and, and there's, they sell how humble bundle sells like DRM free pa- com- comics packets. Um, all of that stuff I think is like way better as well. Cool. Okay, cool. Zach, thank you for your time, uh, for your thoughts. I think that there's a lot of great follow-up here. Um, and Expo Week is kind of the first step to starting to share with the community. So definitely sign up if you guys haven't already. Uh, thanks again to Zach. And, and we'll see you all in the lounges or on Slack. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Z Herring. Uh, DMs are open if you have any more follow-up questions. Happy to discuss. Uh, and again, thank you so much for the opportunity. As always, love love meeting Colonel folks and uh, seeing what y'all are up to. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Bye. Yes.